We're going to talk today about a new error in stroke thrombectomy using an 088 intracranial access. Um, I'm Fawaz Al-Mufti, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Uh, Lee Birnbaum uh, from the University of Texas, uh, uh, San Antonio. Um, Thank you, yes. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Lee Birnbaum. I'm a professor in uh, neurology and neurosurgery at uh, UT Health San Antonio, and we're very excited to uh, start with some questions today. So I'm curious, just a uh, uh, poll to the audience. When you use a guide catheter for mechanical thrombectomy, what percentage of the time is the guide catheter tip placement intracranial? That's to say, within the petrus. Just show of hands. <laughs> so we actually polled the audience, like the people who were attending. And uh, uh, these were the numbers, actually, almost 45%. Um, had the intracranial portion of the, t the tip of the catheter intracranially. Um, and you can see the numbers actually uh, uh, like are, are, are equally distributed uh, to some extent. Um, primarily intracranial, uh, but then there's 27% where uh, uh, like it, it's much lower. So, all right, I'll hand it over to Dr. Birnbaum. Thank you. So, I, you know, with that question, the hope is to discuss how we've had evolution of stroke thrombectomy, not only the thrombectomy, but just the uh, intracranial access as well. And so to have an idea of where we need to go, it's always important to reflect back on where we've been. And this is an uh, excellent uh, slide sequence to uh, remind us of um, how far we've come. So a story goes back to uh, 2004 with the uh, Mercy Retriever, which uh, actually was uh, designed and promoted right here at uh, UCLA Medical Center. And if you uh, take a historical uh, perspective, when you speak to Pierre Gobin, he said they had uh, three tries with the Mercy Retriever. And based on those three tries and three patients, it was either going to move forward or not. And uh, fortunately and serendipitously, uh, two of the three patients, it did a great job with recanalization. And that's really where um, the thrombectomy design started 2004. We moved forward to uh, aspiration systems, which really took off there in 2008, and an idea of having a separator wire that could macerate clot. And then into uh, stent retrievers, so that's really uh, 2010 and 12. So in 2010, we started to understand about the need for support, long sheaths that could be in the cervical internal carotid artery, as well as uh, balloon guide catheters for uh, flow arrest. And when stent retrievers came in uh, 2012, I think most of us would agree that uh, also advanced the field considerably. Um, in 2016, we started to move into uh, direct aspiration technology that was using large bore uh, catheters, which uh, 068 to uh, 074. And, you know, it's exciting that nowadays we're talking about uh, super bore uh, catheters. And this, of course, was the marriage between uh, solitaire and aspiration adapt or salumbra techniques. So what's next for us? Well, here we are in 2020 and beyond and next generation devices. Um, the real focus of uh, this talk is to show how helpful and supportive intracranial access is with uh, 088 as well as systems that use uh, large bore aspiration catheters. So uh, we're gonna divide this talk uh, into two sections and we're gonna um, hand over to Dr. Al Mefti to start with talking about access, which is uh, 088 uh, intracranial access, and then I'll uh, take it back to discuss the uh, aspiration system. Um, so, with regards to um, access, so we currently have obviously the femoral uh, access and the radial access, and with aspiration, we have the Zoom 71, uh, Zoom 55, Zoom 45, and Zoom 35. Um, with as the stroke, like in this era of stroke care where we've like uh, basically, like uh, we're extremely fortunate to be witnessing this like, uh, like revolution where we actually went from uh, long peripheral sheets, which were excellent in giving, providing robust support uh, with uh, cross-cut stainless braid, 
Um, and by 2010, we had the balloon guide catheters that were introduced to achieve um, access and achieve proximal flow control. Uh, by 2011, this basically was the point where we had the introduction of the more, the longer sheets with the flexible tips that provided support with full length stainless steel braid. And uh, obviously the issues with these is you cannot get them intracranially, not, definitely not too high. Um, and in 2022, we have the Zoom 88, which is soft, flexible, distal segment, 110 centimeters in length, and it's the only 088 intracranial access catheter. Um, this is basically the design. Um, it's got an, uh, a flexible, a distal flexible segment, um, and it has enhanced proximal support with a, which, what I think is actually like very interesting, is a continuous mid shaft transition with multiple transition zones. Um, the Zoom 88 enables more control of the procedure. Basically, it allows for navigation control, it allows for clot control, and also flow control. And we're going to go into each one of these like individually, and I have some excellent videos to show, share with you. So another question for the audience. If you encounter a challenge with aspiration, uh, catheter trackability, what is the, your immediate next step? Do you advance your guide catheter higher? Do you deploy a center retriever? Um, do you uh, uh, use a different microcatheter? Do you use a larger micro microwire? Do you use a different aspiration catheter? So A, B, C, D, or E. <laughs> well, we asked you guys. I'm glad we we're not asking the audience now because you're not participating. But we did ask you guys earlier over the course of the conference, and these were the answers. So many people would actually advance their guide catheter higher, which I think is what the, the classic teaching. That's basically what I tell uh, my trainees, my fellows, and what my, many of my colleagues do. Um, in some cases, uh, it may be hard, in which case then you deploy a stent retriever, you anchor it, and you basically try to like, get your, guide ca your aspiration catheter higher. And 9% uh, basically said that they would use a different microcatheter. So with regards to the Zoom 88, this is, this is, a, a, this is a, a, an excellent video demonstrating how it aids in the navigation across the ophthalmic segment. So this is the Zoom 71. You can see as um, for many people who've done these procedures and like it can easily get caught. Not, not only this, any aspiration catheter can get caught on the ophthalmic, but as you advance your Zoom 88 higher, it changes the vectors, it changes the trajectory, allowing for more uh, smooth transition and e smoother navigation across the ophthalmic segment and ophthalmic artery. Um, these are excellent pictures, again, demonstrating how uh, the Zoom 88, uh, like as it was elevated, like raised, uh, it was able to allow the Zoom 71 to essentially navigate into the M1 and uh, uh, perform additional passes. Um, additionally, the Zoom 88 allows for a shorter distance for the clot to travel. So let's think about this for a second. So if I have a guide catheter that's parked in the uh, in the petrus, or just below the petrus segment. And I have another clot that, like, and, and my clot is all the way up, obviously, in the IC terminus, M1, uh, or even M2. As I'm aspirating this back, and many of, our, many of my colleagues are now adopting an aspiration-first approach, you have a quite a, like, a long distance to pull that cap, uh, the clot back. And I'll show you. This here, the catheter is, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, but the guide catheter is actually in the petrus segment, proximal to that loop. And as the clot's coming back, being retrieved, look what happens to the clot. Because of this long distance, not infrequently, you will lose that clot. And I think every one of us has, had, like, has faced this issue. It is extremely frustrating and disheartening. Um, this is another case where the Zoom 88 is actually, again, I'm sorry, I don't have a marker, but you can see it. it's very close to the ICA terminus, just, prox like, just proximal to where the Zoom 71 is. And you very clearly see you have very short distance to essentially pull and retrieve the clot, hence minimizing the likelihood of losing that clot. All right, so every question number three. All right, hopefully everybody's like energized now. So how important is flow control during mechanical thrombectomy? What was that? <laughs> very important, fairly important, important, slightly important, I don't care. All right, well, we asked you guys earlier, people seem to believe that flow control is very important. And I don't disagree. 36% um, said it was very important. 
fairly important 27% and uh, like at least 27% uh, thought that it was important. Um, <clears throat> the Zoom 88 provides distal flow control. Um, and you can see over here, this is the Zoom 71 in position and the Zoom 88 being navigated upwards intracranially. Um, and I actually like this animation a lot because it definitely highlights how you have reduction in flow, anti, like reduction in, in oh, oh, like anti-grade flow, which will minimize the likelihood of like, um, like dislodging the clot, embolite to new territories. This is a, uh, an example where the, uh, the Zoom 88 is at the ICA terminus showing complete distal flow control. And <clears throat> so shifting gears a little bit just to go over the data. I'm always talking about, um, I say, in God we trust, everybody else, show me the money, show me the data. Um, so intracranial large bore catheter. So uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Milburn um, did this in like single center study uh, out of Oshner Medical Center uh, to evaluate the benefits of intracranial guide catheter placement for aspiration thrombectomy. They basically, this was a single center, single institution retrospective study um, that enrolled almost 92 patients treated with either aspiration first approach, uh, with an aspiration first approach from August 2020 to February 2022. Um, patients were allocated into two groups. One group where the distal tip of the guide catheter was positioned in the petrous segment or higher or more distal. Um, this was almost 52 patients. This was the intracranial group. And there was a, another group where the distal tip of the guide catheter was positioned on the cervical ICA or more proximal, and which, which was the control group. Um, the clot location was basically in the intracranial ICA, M1, or MT occlusions. And you can see over here, this is uh, a table that shows the baseline demographics and uh, characteristics of these stroke patients. Um, and I like to highlight that there was no statistical difference between the two groups. Um, they were both relatively equal. Um, so with regards to the results, the things that we always want to look at is like, what was the final perfusion, final Tiki 2C? Um, they found that 83% Tiki, uh, uh, Tiki 2C compared to the control. Uh, better first pass effect, 52% versus 28%. Shorter procedural time, um, almost 24 minutes versus 34 minutes. And the incidence of intracranial hemorrhage was, and again, all of these were statistically significant. The, with regards to the incidence of intracranial hemorrhage, and again, a lot of us are always concerned about like getting a catheter that's really high, and am I going to cause a, like a problem intracranially? Um, zero percent risk of intracranial hemorrhage uh, versus 6.3 in the control group. Granted, there are limitations to the study. It is a single center um, uh, and uh, 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 retrospective review, um, but their conclusion um, appropriately states that intracranial guide catheter position position was associated with uh, improved final uh, 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 reperfusion rates, better first pass effect, and quicker reperfusion time in patients suffering from emergent large vessel inclusion. Um, this is another study that evaluated various guide catheter positions on distal flow. This was a, uh, uh, like done in the lab, and uh, they basically found that uh, uh, you, they, you basically used a flow model for real-time pressure and flow data recording. The guide catheters uh, were placed in varying positions in the ICA and the MCA. Um, and Zoom 71 was placed in the MCA in all groups. Um, and this is basically what they found. Um, and you can see uh, the flow in the MCA was lowest when uh, the Zoom 88 was actually in the MCA. And Zoom 88 was in the ICA terminus, it was slightly lower. Um, and when it was in the ICA terminus, so the higher you were able to get your guide catheter, the more, uh, 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 the better or the better flow reduction um, that you get than uh, like any balloon guide catheter. Um, in the assist registry, balloon guide catheters required more time with improvement in reperfusion. And you can see there was a six minute longer uh, time with balloon guide catheters. Um, there, the, uh, conclusions, the conclusions of the authors was that the use of balloon guide catheters causes delayed care of patients and did not lead to fir higher first pass effect. Um, and with that, I hand it over to Dr. Birnbaum. Thank you, Dr. Mefti. So going back to the slide again, our first focus was to really discuss access with 088 and how putting an 088 catheter intracranially is going to give you the support you need to use the entire system. 
So the entire system includes the uh, lineup of uh, aspiration catheters. And when I first started to use the uh, aspiration catheters, um, I used them with a variety of uh, microcatheters to facilitate uh, moving the system intracranially. But with time, it's an understanding that the uh, catheters are designed and work best uh, together. So your uh, 071 uh, works uh, really well with a 35 inside and the 55 with the 35 inside. But there is a lineup uh, so that you can match the size of the vessel with the size of the aspiration catheter. So what is uh, unique about the uh, aspiration catheters? Well, one unique feature is the beveled tip, which is an angled tip, so it increases the surface area and enhances the ability for the aspiration catheter to uh, hold on to the clot. I also like to point out that the uh, bumper, there's an extra soft polymer bumper at the end of the aspiration catheter. And I think in general, uh, that gives us good confidence with really engaging clot, right? Um, it's not enough just to be up next to the clot. I think it's important to engage it. And that bumper is going to give you confidence that you can really uh, grab on to the proximal part of the thrombus. And here's an example of uh, uh, you know, proximal clot engagement versus a full uh, clot engagement and showing again the importance of having the distal bumper engaged in the clot as well as the enhanced surface area to be able to hold on and grab on the more of the clot proximally when we're extracting. So it's very important to understand the uh, technique with uh, the imperative lineup of uh, aspiration catheters. So as we were uh, demonstrating, when you're using the Zoom 88 as your platform, it really has to be intracranially. It's not enough to leave it in the cervical ICA. Um, at least in the petrous and really ideally in the cavernous, if not higher. And you're going to need that because that is the uh, support to be able to climb the entire system. And as some of the examples we'll show later, it's also the support you need when you have um, medium-sized uh, vessels and when you're taking the smaller aspiration catheters, the 035, uh, more distally uh, to engage the clot. So these are some examples and cases that I think will be able to highlight the uh, uh, aspiration uh, system. Again, uh, the first part is always uh, high initial uh, ascent. So this is a right uh, middle cerebral artery, right M1 occlusion. And I think an, an important point for all of us when we're doing thrombectomy, as uh, Dr. Elmefti was alluding to, is what does the ophthalmic segment look like? How tortuous is that? In many ways, this is a, a great case, even a chip shot. The ophthalmic segment um, has a very um, easy angle, if you will, and is, is a great case for um, most systems. So these are going to be some examples of showing, at this point, the uh, 071 is up and engaged in the uh, right middle cerebral artery, distal M1. This was uh, a large vessels, right? So we do talk about sizing the aspiration uh, for the size of the vessels, and this uh, patient had large um, uh, MCA. So once the video starts, once the um, uh, 71 is out in the clot, you can see the whole system being used here. That's the uh, Zoom 88 uh, rising intracranially and going into the uh, middle cerebral artery M1 segment. And there's a, a few points here. One is. Um, this is an example, and we'll also show it on the lateral, of how uh, trackable the system is. So we're advancing up the, uh, the 088 here. So to advance up the uh, uh, 088, it's um, critical to have your uh, 071 uh, distally, and also um, to encourage the use of uh, aspiration as an anchoring system. And this allows you to use the, the whole system together to maximize its aspiration capacity, and there's the uh, end result of the uh, thrombectomy. So these are the uh, ideal outcomes we're all looking for. Okay, let's move into a more complicated example. So these are, in my experience, some of the more uh, difficult cases in which you have left uh, terminus, or in this case, uh, intracranial uh, ICA occlusion. As you can see down low, this is the uh, 088, 
And this is just a glide wire that's advancing into the, uh, the thrombus. And it shows how um, um, well the 088 system uh, navigates, just over a glide wire and navigating into the, uh, the thrombus. And then using uh, the system to, be, to begin the uh, thrombectomy procedure, and uh, already you've uh, cleaned out quite a bit of the uh, ICA uh, thrombus. So still some residual uh, left uh, MCA clot. I think all of us um, want a uh, first pass success, but that's not always the case, especially with large clot burden. So again, uh, this is this idea of climbing the system. So in this first video here, again, it's showing the 71 is advancing up and engaging into the uh, distal uh, MCA. And then once that's in place, uh, with aspiration in the 71, uh, we're advancing up the 88. And I can't stress this enough, is these uh, large distal platforms, if you want to bring them up higher, um, a great anchor is just to aspirate with your large uh, 71 catheter. And there it moves up. And you can really appreciate it as well here on the final video, which shows it around the lateral. And you can ap appreciate, again, the difficulty here in this uh, ophthalmic segment turn and how well the system moves and navigates around. So um, Dr. Birnbaum just had a question about this case. Sure. So are you aspirating off the 071 as you're advancing the uh, Zoom 88? You yes, are, right? I am. Okay, very interesting. And I think, and that's just a, a key takeaway because uh, many times when we want to advance our larger uh, aspiration systems intracranially, um, sometimes we need an anchor of some sort, sure. right? And so uh, in the past, this would have been a, a situation for me where perhaps um, using a stent retriever or something as an anchor was uh, needed. But um, the anchor really becomes the 71 uh, during aspiration. So the aspiration starts, and after about uh, 30 or 60 seconds, um, slowly pulling back on the 71, and your Zoom 88 will climb. It, it wants will climb, to climb on its own. Yep. Yeah. So again, um, um, this was a, uh, a bit of a longer case, but after uh, achieving recanalization in the uh, MCA, there was some uh, distal uh, uh, MCA clot in M2s and beyond. And this is where the system continues to shine. Because in the past, uh, to move out uh, aspiration catheters to these uh, distal uh, M2s and beyond uh, can be very difficult, especially with tortuous anatomy. And so these were cases in the past where I think a stent retriever uh, was uh, often used in my practice. Uh, but as you can see from these examples, when you have something like uh, your 088 and your 71 um, intracranially, it uh, gives you support, as you can see in the lateral, to move out uh, something like their 035 uh, aspiration catheter so you can continue your thrombectomy procedure. So that was the... Um, superior branch, and as you can see, there was a posterior inferior branch that we still had to take care of and just continue with that same technique. And the, the a big reason why this is capable, I can't stress enough, is if you have the 088 in an intracranial position, cavernous and above, it really gives great support to be able to go more distal to go after those medium and small vessel occlusions. Okay. And, a, and a great end result. So a last case is um, a posterior circulation case I wanted to share. Um, this was a, a bilateral vertebral artery occlusions, and uh, the best approach we thought was actually from a, a left radial approach, but the left radial was small. So uh, we just used a uh, six French radial sheath because we weren't convinced the radial artery could take anything larger than that. This was a patient with a lot of atherosclerotic disease. Um, but it shows some uh, other features of the system if you're a radial first uh, that you can use. So in this case, uh, this was a, a Zoom 45, which uh, works uh, very well for posterior circulation. And we just took it right through a, a six French radial sheath with a, a fathom wire for support and uh, just drove it right through the uh, left uh, vertebral artery. And again, just with a glide wire, um, you can 
we can go a long way. We did a picture here just showing the uh, um, vertebral artery occlusion. We then performed a uh, thrombectomy, moved through the uh, vert occlusion. At this point, this was a fathom wire, which I um, find to be very helpful, especially when you're not using any kind of microcatheter, and moved um, into the uh, distal basilar and left PCA where there was an additional occlusion. And again, this is all just from a left uh, six French slim sheath, so it just uh, highlights how well the uh, system navigates. Okay, some final pictures. So uh, that was a case where the radial artery was small, um, but if you have an appropriate uh, sized radial artery, um, it really leads to the introduction of what is Zoom RDL, or radial access system. And this is the first uh, radial stroke uh, platform. And it comes with its own dilator, and you can go uh, first with like a seven French slim uh, to dilate the artery, and then you can uh, advance with the, the dilator that comes with the system um, through the uh, radial and then into um, intracranial position. Again, the goal of this, just like the Zoom 88, is to advance it uh, intracranially. Again, it has smooth introduction into the radial artery, has an extended hydrophilic coating and an optimized dilator, as I mentioned. Uh, engineered support profile to reach intracranial ICA. So uh, in many ways, the same uh, techniques as we've been highlighting with the Zoom 88 is what uh, can be done here with the Zoom, Zoom RDL through a radial approach. And again, it's a large 088 lumen, so it is compatible with uh, large or aspiration catheters. So again, um, just to kind of circle back and highlight, uh, uh, we believe that uh, the new, area, new era and a new uh, path for thrombectomy and stroke is uh, intracranial access with 088 systems. Um, and now there's uh, two approaches, both femoral and radial, that you can uh, use for large 088 intracranial access. And as a last uh, picture, this is uh, courtesy of Dr. El Mufti and some of his uh, uh, great uh, artwork that he does. So thanks for sharing this with the uh, right. group. No, of course. Th thank you for sharing your satisfying cases that ICA tandem occlusion is. Uh, I applaud your resilience and tenacity. Thank, thank you. you very much.